But let's start out in Lowell. So this is, this is where you achieved your first major success as the head of a police department reducing crime. Tell us about that. Tell us about your own life. How did you come to that, and, and how did it happen? Well, I grew up in the city, and uh, my dad in Lowell. was in Lowell. Yeah, I grew up in Lowell, and uh, my father was a police officer. And so I went into police work uh, when I was 22. I was hired by the uh, Lowell Police Department. And um, I, I uh, got to work um, and see what the community was like from a police officer's perspective. And it's a very different place when you are responding to calls for emergencies than what your average citizen sees or, or learns about the city. So you realize you can do a lot of good. Uh, you can help a lot of people. And I, and I know that sounds trite, but that was really what was my motivating uh, factor, the, the, the reason I get into the business. So um, I, um, I was a police officer for uh, a, approximately uh, four years, five years before I became a sergeant, then worked my way up through the ranks uh, working uh, in narcotics enforcement and uh, sexual assault uh, as a detective. Um, and then ultimately, I, um, I started to take tests and did really well in the tests. So I worked my way up the ranks, and at 37, I became the uh, police chief in, uh, in Lowell. And at the time, I was introduced to this concept of community policing. A man named Bill Bratton was doing that down here in Boston. I uh, was taught by, by several professors from, from Harvard, actually, uh, uh, people like uh, Judge Kelling and Frank Hartman and uh, Dutch Leonard, mm -hmm. um, and, and a whole slew of, of individuals who were sort of looking at community policing a, as a different way to respond. So you're in Lowell until 2006, right. and then you take on this, you know, this this bigger job in Boston. You get more, uh, you get more more officers under you. What did you notice that was different? What felt what felt different when you came to the Boston Police Department as opposed to Lowell? Well, it was a matter of scale. I mean, mm -hmm. it was ten times larger than than Lowell in budget and personnel and everything else that I had to deal with. So uh, scale was a was a huge problem. Um, but there's also a command structure there to deal with that. So it really wasn't wasn't too problematic for me. I, I, I stepped into it and felt very comfortable there very quickly. The questions I was asked were, um, are you a real cop? Did you really work on the street? Did you, you know, and when they found out I worked in narcotics and did raids and r arrested a lot of people. You I, had I, yeah, I had no problem at all. Yeah. Yeah. How is community policing different as, as you saw? It's focused on prevention. It's really a completely different way of looking at what you do as a police officer right on the street. You're trying to identify a problem and solve that problem and thereby reduce the number of times you have to go back to the address that you usually go to. And, um, and, if, and if you look at policing as a service that gets into the complex problems of, of, a, of an inner city, and allows the police officers to leverage the local and state governments, and sometimes the federal government, um, it can make a difference in people's lives. Absolutely. Um, how, how, does it, how does it work tangibly? So you're trying to solve the problem of providing safety. You're trying to eliminate drug dealing from a particular address. How do you go about it? Well, beyond law enforcement, which is always, uh, arrest and prosecution is always going to be one tool that you, you have. you got to do it. It's not going to. But it shouldn't be the only tool. Mm -hmm. And so, for instance, if you go into a, a troubled property um, and you're answering a call on the second floor, but you recognize that there are health and safety violations throughout the building, if you can call the building inspector's office and have the building inspector come down and hold the landlord accountable for correcting those deficiencies, you improve the lives of all three pe all three families in that in that in that tenement in that three family tenement, right? Um, and you build some trust, even more importantly, with the, with the residents, right? Right. So if you're, if you're actually providing services to the community and not simply taking one of their relatives away for prosecution, they start to look at you in a whole different way. And uh, that was really the key to it. And if you can include um, social service agencies, uh, child protective agencies, um, other state agencies that can come in to assist, it's a, it, it, the, 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 your ability to leverage government for the individual is unparalleled with any other agency that's out there. What were some of the harder experiences you had in terms of breaking through to the community and convincing them to trust the police? Well, I remember uh, at, at the, uh, I went to a community meeting in the basement of the Mission Church in Roxbury. And um, there were probably 40 or 45 uh, young black males who were from the neighborhood. 
and they were angry. Mm -hmm. And this was in 2006. It was one of my first community meetings, just after I took over the department. They were being searched by police officers on the basketball court. Every time they would go down to the park and to play basketball or to hang around, um, they, they called it posting me up. They, the cops would be posting me up. I didn't even know what the term meant at the time. It's a basketball term, and I, I figured it out afterwards. But basically, it was a stop and frisk situation. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I, I asked some very specific questions. I said, who are the officers that are posting you up? Is it the uniformed officers? And they were, uh, they were very clear, no, no, it wasn't the uniform cops. We get along all right with the uniform cops. It's these plain clothes guys that work in specialty units. And they, and, and they didn't understand the structure of the department, but I did. And after a few questions, I realized that it was uh, the gang unit and um, something called anti-crime officers. That It's kind of a unique organization in Boston where they have plain clothes officers who are actually patrol officers. They're not detectives, but they... They, they're not in uniform. And they do great work out on the street. This isn't an indictment of either of those two sure, units. They're tremendously effective. But they were spending a lot of time searching people. And I went back to the department and I met with them. I met with the gang unit. I met with somebody of the anti-crime officers. And um, I found out that they were getting an implicit message from the administration of the police department to get as many guns off the street as they could. Mm -hmm. um, they were getting medals for putting for getting guns off the street. They were uh, receiving main, you know, major accolades for it. So it became the you know the bright shiny thing that all the detectives right. wanted to do. And the way they were doing that was every time they saw a group of young men, they would pat them down to see if they could find a gun. Right. And and I I was able to curtail that 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 activity not just the p stop and frisk stuff, but the, the bosses were also asking for field interrogation cards to be made out on everybody. And there was a constant, uh, constant sort of mantra from sergeants and lieutenants, how many FIOs did you do today? How many FIOs did you do today? So, so the officers felt compelled to get more and more every, and every time they filled out an FIO, somebody in the neighborhood felt that they were being targeted. Right. We said, listen, I don't care how many FIOs you do anymore. So I made sure that the sergeants and lieutenants stopped that constant right. kind of increase of FIOs. Right. So we changed that mentality. 